Welcome back to the 150K Podcast. I'm your host, Joe Graham, where we help take your dreams to six figures and beyond. Today, I have with me Fonzie, the better half of the Biz Bros. Hey, Fonzie, for people that don't know you well, it's like I do, tell people a little bit about your background. I know you're the better half of the Biz Bros, but <laughs> people might not know what that is. So give us a little bit of background on what you guys do. Yeah, absolutely, man. Thank you so much for having me here. First of all, I really appreciate you. And, you know, as you mentioned, the better half of the Biz Bros. The other half is my actual brother, which his name is Luis Daniel. He was already, you know, he had the pleasure of being here on your show first. And my my first name is actually Luis as well. So both my brother and I were both named Luis, just so people can differentiate us and maybe a little bit of a marketing move. <laughs> I started branding myself as Fonzie. Some people have seen Happy Days, and every time I say Fonzie, they're like, what? The Fonz? He was so cool. Well, plot twist, I had no idea who the Fonz was when I, <laughs> you know, started embracing this name. But nice. after I looked it up, I embraced it. I, I really like the name now. So that aside, um, I'm originally from Venezuela. I grew up there. I lived my first 18 years of my life in there. And my dream was always to play soccer professionally. I didn't know anything else, if I'm being honest, you know. Uh, my mom, once she was a college teacher, my dad kind of like bounced between jobs here and there. Just he had that hustle mentality, but he wasn't necessarily like a full on entrepreneur. He was just trying to figure out how to make ends meet. And, you know, I feel like we grab a lot of that stuff that we learned, but my whole dream was just becoming a professional soccer player. So when I was 18, we got the opportunity to come to the States on a soccer scholarship, move here. You know, I was very excited, no opportunity, uh, did my studies. I actually ended up making it into a professional soccer team for just quite a little bit of time. And it was absolutely amazing. But one day the coaches came and they were like, hey, we're not going to offer you a final contract. And, oh, that was devastating. But that was the end of pretty much my soccer career. And I started thinking, well, what is next? What's mm -hmm. next for me, right? And I knew from a very long time that I didn't want a regular job again the only thing in my mind was uh soccer so i guess part of what i see a lot of athletes go into is entrepreneurship so i decided with my brother that i was living with him at the time we decided to start something of our own so mm -hmm. we you know we started sticker company t-shirt screen printing then transition a little bit into digital marketing media after like five years it evolved into what we're doing right now which is is we have a content agency. Mostly we help people that produce long form content, turn that into what we call top of funnel content and help them just share it everywhere, be consistent, uh, pretty much a plug and play content team for, for your business. No, that's awesome. And it, it was funny. The thing that hit me right from the start when you talked about it was you went from doing something super rare that people do, which is being a professional athlete to doing something that's extremely hard as well, being an entrepreneur. So it's kind of yeah. like that's in your blood, which is kind of cool. Or like Alex Sharpton would say, we go into the future and create something new. So I love that. Um, and you guys, because when I talked to your other brother, Luis, you guys hadn't done your big announcements. So you guys actually have done a bunch of different changes. Tell us a little bit about that. Cause I know you did like a four hour live recently or something. <laughs> Yeah, so a little bit of context on that. About two years ago, we actually started our podcast. You can see the sign back here that's called Content is Profit. And that was game changing for us. That's literally what changed the whole game for, for us. And two years later, right, we announced that we joined the HubSpot Podcast Network, which honestly, it's a, it's a great milestone. It feels amazing. And just having such a big company you know, put their faith and their belief in a podcast like, like yours feels very rewarding, right? Mm -hmm. So again, to give a little bit more context on that, on the opportunity per se, they, they are paying us. They're pretty much investing in the podcast mm -hmm. so we can grow it. We can grow the audience. Obviously, how does that look? How does that benefit the podcast? The HubSpot Podcast Network, the, we advertise, you know, mm -hmm. their yep. products, their services inside of our podcast. And the more we grow, they invest more and they pay us more. So it's a win-win situation. Yeah, but yeah. I really want to kind of like drive in the, the value of podcasting for us because I can say, yeah, podcasting has been great. And people usually think, oh, you, so you have a big audience, right? 
podcasting, people usually go to Joe Rogan, you know, all this, this big podcast that have a big audience. That's not necessarily our case, right? Our audience is actually not that big. But how it was impactful for us is the relationships that we managed to build. So mm -hmm. about three years ago, we actually attempted to start a podcast. It was called Bruce and Bros. The whole concept of it <laughs> was to, you know, talk marketing while we were having a beer nice. at, the, at the end of the night. And, mm -hmm. and we just put so much friction in the whole process to create the content that we recorded five episodes, but we published zero. It was, it was awful. It was pretty bad. Yeah. And I got you. Yeah. And we had invested in like all the equipment, literally what you see right now is what we bought for that one podcast. Mm -hmm. And we put everything in a closet a year after that, we pretty much ran into a situation with some business owners that we were pitching and, you know, we were selling content services and long story short, We weren't, you know, drinking our, our own Kool-Aid. We weren't publishing. We weren't creating content. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that led to no deals. Yep. And at the end of the day, we're like, okay, well, if we're going to sell this thing, we got to prove it that it worked. We want, we, you know, we need to, again, drink our own Kool-Aid. Right. So we decided to start Content This Profit after a few, you know, challenging moments here and there at the beginning of COVID. We grabbed the whole equipment out of the closet, you know, dusted And we started recording. And honestly, since that moment, everything changed for us because of the relationships that we managed to build through the podcast. Um, the podcast allowed us, you know, develop some thought leadership, develop to, you know, just when you put your thoughts into words, you start realizing the things that you believe in. And it has been a very powerful tool for us to grow our business. We got clients through the podcast, incredible partnerships through the podcast. We went from being just a pair of freelancer brothers to actually owning a business and having a team. The literally the podcast <clears throat> changed everything. So the fact that two years later, on the exact two year mark, literally, HubSpot came and they were like, "Hey, we want to make you guys part of the network." And that was an incredible news. And when they shared that with us, we just were so thankful. So now it's a whole new game because <clears throat> the previously two years we were focused on building relationships. Now, yes, we're still focused on building relationships, but we're adding a new layer, which is we got to build the audience. Yeah. Well, and I love that because here's the thing that, and I know your story a little bit that people don't realize for those, those of you listening, these guys do three episodes a week. <laughs> It's not like they did just say, oh, I'm going to do a podcast and throw one, one out once a month and maybe I'll come back to it. When they went all in, they went all in and their whole <laughs> concept is content is profit. So like they, you guys planned that out and pushed it through. So I, I commend you on that for sure. Thank you. Um, I definitely do what you do with that, with the whole making connections to help people and just having the voice. Um, did you yeah. ever feel weird about it when you were talking? Like I've never had the issue of with podcasting. I can talk and I listen to my podcast, which most people don't like to. I yeah. listen to it to make it better. Did you ever have an issue with how you sounded or how you felt when you first did it? Or did you just love it right from the go? I, I Yeah, I love this question. Um, we, we have a pretty funny story with this. You know, a lot of times when we create content and we look at it, I've heard a lot of people, I've seen, you know, people's content right next to them and they're like, oh man, I hate my voice. I hate how, how this sounds. I hate how it looks, like all this negative talk, right? And yes, my brother and I, we understand that we are like overly positive. But, you know, the first time we did the podcast, we actually, again, we invested in the equipment and I want to make it clear. You don't need the equipment to start a podcast. You right. don't need the equipment to start publishing. All you need is your phone. That's it. Right. Yeah. So for us, though, we saw the investment as a commitment. We're like, man, if we purchase a thousand bucks in equipment, we are definitely going to take action. Yeah. You definitely. saw that that wasn't like that because then we put the whole equipment in the closet for a year. Mm -hmm. But that being said, the very first time I remember we plugged everything and, and I don't know if it was like an equipment thing, but we plugged everything. We sat down, we put our headphones on, we started the roadcaster. And as soon as we started speaking to the mic, my brother and I look at each other and we're like, dude, we sound awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love yeah, and it. you know, you you can call that whatever, like wow, you're so cocky or or whatnot. But I don't know. I guess we had we thought we had radio voices. We're like, wow, mm -hmm. man, like or or voice through the mic. Is this the mic that is making us sound like this or what? But it sounds it, it sounds cool. Now mm -hmm. I will say 
I do not listen to 100% of the episodes we put out. I mean, we have over 280 yeah. episodes. Uh, I do enjoy and love listening to other people's podcasts. So I want to make room for other people's podcasts. But I do try to listen to at least like one episode of ours a week. Mm -hmm. And mostly I listen to it. And then, again, there's so many golden nuggets and how we call them golden boulders inside yep. of those episodes as well. But I want to revisit them. Sometimes I listen to it. And I'm like, oh, man, I didn't remember we talk about that stuff. Mm -hmm. And also it's a way for you to assess kind of like your performance in the podcast and then say, oh, wow, I think I could have done a little bit better in this side of the conversation. Right. Maybe yep. look at yep. these transitions that I'm doing, this type of questions that I'm asking. Right. Um, and then you just look at it with a, a little bit of a critical eye uh, or I guess critical ear in this case, and then try to try to improve. But, yeah. you know, short answer to your question, I, we've never had an issue. Honestly, we just, we love the, not the craft per se. We love the connection, mm -hmm. just building the relationship. It's so much fun. Yeah. No, no, I'm with you. When I started, that was not an issue for me at all. Like, I, I like that whole dynamic of it. Yeah. So let's and and here, sorry, real quick. Um, Are you good? I want to, I want to challenge the person that is listening right now. If maybe they thought about, hey, I want to start a podcast or not even podcast. I want to create content, video content, put myself out there. But they are actually, when they see their videos, they're like, oh, I don't look, I don't like how I look or I don't like how I sound. I actually want to challenge people to think about whether it is actually that you don't like how you sound or look or you're just afraid of putting the content on there and maybe yeah. being judged. Because at the end of the day, that when we look at the root of why aren't we posting or doing something, you can create a bunch of, you know, tags and labels on why you're not doing it. Perfectionism, right? Or I don't like how it look. I don't like how it sound. Uh, it's not the post-production. It's not the right one. But at the end of the day, when we look back at it, we're probably no, not putting the content out there just because we're afraid of what other people might say. Yep. So yep. I would say, take a look inside, right? Does it actually matter if you personally don't like how you sound or look or is more important to put your message out there into the world and, you know, potentially impact some other people's life or help other people. Yeah. You, you know, what's funny about that. I literally did a post on that this morning about not being afraid of uh, how people think. And then I did a live about shining your voice and your light and just being you because like yeah. I do weird lives. You've seen me do lives when I did your 45 day challenge, I walk outside. There's wind. Sometimes people walk in front of me, whatever, but that's just my environment. And I think you need to be willing, like you said, to, just share your message because you're going to draw the people you need to draw. It doesn't have to be perfect. In fact, I think most people don't like perfect at this point. They just Absolutely. want real and authentic. Absolutely. I mean, and you, you see it a lot with big brands. Like you see ads now and sometimes you don't even know it's an ad because it looks so organic and so real that it's like, wow, I didn't realize they were trying to sell me something. <laughs> right. Um, and the other thing is, you got to be comfortable with the person you're going to spend the rest of your life with. And that is yourself. Yes. So if you look at yourself in a video or listen to yourself in a podcast and you're not happy with how you are sounding or looking, and I, I would challenge you to just do some, some inner work in there because, you know, the, the, there might be something in there that might be stopping you from putting your message out there and potentially helping other people. Yeah. Yep. No, I agree. I think a lot of times people care so much about how it's supposed to look instead of who they're supposed to impact. Yeah. Just impact people. No, I love Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Kind of, and, oh, oh, sorry, real quick. No, oh, I, just wanted, I just wanted to ask uh, oh. for, for perspective in hearing people so they don't think like, oh, these guys got to figure it out. I still deal with those things, right? I feel like I'm just a little bit more aware because I've created a lot of content. We've done a lot of podcast episodes. So now when I find myself in, in that place of, oh, oh man do I really want to share about this or do I really want to create this video I get to recognize that I'm falling into that negative space and then I can force myself to take action regardless right it's not like I just pop the camera open or grab the mic and start talking and it's all perfect no I, I still deal with all those things pretty much every single time that I try to create some piece of content yeah no no I'm with you but at least you got the beard you know, at least you got the beard. So you're good to go there. You can kind of just do the most amazing man in the world type of vibe if you need to. Oh, man, that'll be funny. Yeah, that, that, that'll be a good parody. You should. You should maybe do that. That might be a good reel for you guys to do. 
yeah, maybe a reel or a, some sort of ad with that. Yeah, we, we've had some some crazy ideas here and there, but you know, the other thing that we deal with is uh, friction, right? On a day to day basis, a lot of people, again, maybe they create and they're not afraid to put it out there, but then they are like, oh, I need to edit, I need to do all these things, and we were there, so. That's actually how the 45 challenge that you did started is we wanted to remove friction, just put ourselves out there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if we talk about all these creative ideas, we've had plenty, but we're like, oh, there's a lot of friction, a friction to put that into the world, you know, the scripting, the editing, and we're more of the type of content creators that jump on the mic and start talking or go on yeah. the and do the 45 live. No, but that's why we get along so well, because we just free form. We, we might be talking at one thing, then we're going to go to something else, and it's fine. Yeah. But it does lead me into, because, like, you guys also produce content for people. That's kind of what your business is about, through their podcasts, through other things that they do. Tell us a little bit more about that side of business, because I know more about your podcast side, but for, like, producing content and stuff for people, tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, just to be clear, like, we actually don't, produce the podcast for people we work with people that are already producing the podcast right and then they send us that and we turn that into multiple pieces of content so they can you know promote themselves uh and their businesses or what they're doing their message in whatever platform that it is that they want to right it is pretty pretty custom kind of like the the output what people are looking for what we specialize in is or process we have a process that we call the M2M, which is macro to micro. That's what it stands for. And, you know, pretty much everything that we bring into that system, we have a very specific type of input that we work with, right? Which is long form content. Mm -hmm. And then it is multi-purpose into a lot of different pieces. That, that so it, it depends. It depends on the purpose, right? That um, the clients that we're working with have or whatnot. Something that, that we did start doing um, recently was supporting actually some of our clients with their recording, right? So, you know, we realized that a lot of people when they're going in other people's podcasts or even in their podcasts, they share sometimes the same message over and over again, right? And that is marketing. You, mm -hmm. you get to tell those stories over and over again until people really understand and, and you become top of mind for these people. But we realized that a lot of the content that we're editing was pretty much always the same, right? Maybe different background, maybe different shirt, but it was like, man, like we're just giving them the same content over and over again. So now we're assisting them where we jump on calls with them and we do a previous research and, you know, we come up with questions and we do more of that top of funnel content specific with them, right? So let's say for you, we would bring a, a sales related question, right? Mm -hmm. Like, hey, how do I manage to scale from, you know, uh, 50, outbound connections to a hundred uh, outbound connections every single day. And then that's your hook. And then you start riffing about that. And then our teams takes that and many other questions and turn that into multiple pieces of content. No, that's good. So you help them with their storytelling, the way that they yeah. do it, because their content might be the same. Like with me, my sales process is a sales process, but how I deliver it or what I bring to the table or what aspect of it I'm going to hit at that day, you don't want it to be saying the same thing over and over again because it would get boring. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and we can talk about the same questions to say your 10 frequently asked questions. We can talk about those 10 all the time, but you can do it in different ways, right? Like question number one, uh, let's say your frequently asked question is how do I scale to $10,000 a month? Let's say example. Mm -hmm. We can talk about that question in many different angles. We, I can share a story about yep. that, right? I can share a how-to about that. Um, I can share the why do I want to scale, scale to $10,000 a month. Right? So there's multiple ways to do these things. But yeah, we offer support around, again, creating and crafting that type of content and then adding that production arm that usually it's friction for people because they have to hire an editor, a designer, all these different pieces to their business. And we bring that in and then just edit everything and they just get all the content on the back end for them to be consistent. At the end of the day, we just want them to show up consistently. Mm -hmm. We call it daily consistent content, right? That's what we want, daily consistent content so they can be top of mind. Yeah, no, I love that. That's good because I think that's the thing that people miss. They'll hit and they'll drop a bunch of content like one, two days in a row, then they disappear for a week and they do it again. And people are like, whatever. 
But if you yeah. can be consistent in your message and your content, um, like your episodes drop every time, my episode drops every Tuesday. I do throw in a solo episode every once in a while, just random as a surprise. But everyone <laughs> knows, like with my podcast, I pop one of them. You know, it's just yeah. being there and being consistent. I know when I did the 45 day live, it was actually a lot more um, like I'm comfortable in front of the camera anyway, but I got even more comfortable because again, I was doing those reps over and over again. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and just to give a little bit of context for people that might be asking themselves, what is the 45 live? You guys have mentioned it already like three times. I'm, I'm curious about it. Well, when my brother and I were in that kind of like weird situation where we're pitching people about content and they came back to us and they were like, well, this is all great, but where's your stuff? All right. That was like a punch in the gut. And that's when we decided, okay, we need to start publishing consistently. Mm -hmm. And up to that moment, we had those spikes that you were talking about, right? Like, oh, we published for a little bit and then we disappear, published for a little bit, disappeared. So the question that we ask ourselves is like, okay, how do we publish in a consistent basis? How do we stay consistent? And around that time, we were actually doing the 75 hard, which for those that don't know, is a physical challenge that you have I've to work it. out <laughs> twice a day for 75 days in a row and a whole bunch of other activities. It's very, very challenging. And my brother and I were actually in the middle of it and we were doing pretty good. And we were like, huh, look, we're doing this challenge and it's keeping us accountable. What if we do something similar with content? So that's when we decided, oh, wow, let's do it. 45 days. And how do we remove the friction? Let's just go live, right? Like you don't need to edit anything. You press a button, you start talking, your message is out into the world, and then you press stop. And that's it. You don't need to edit. Your message is out. And for us, that was pretty important too, because it, it kind of led us to what is still our motto, which is message over production, mm -hmm. right? At the end of the day, you can have the best edited video in the world. The, the post-production value can be absolutely insane. But if the message is trash, nobody's yeah. going to listen to it, right? Like you, you might get people to look at it for a few seconds and say, wow, this production is really cool. But then they're going to tune out because they're not invested in the message at the end of the day. They're the real takeaways. But, and I want people to think about, maybe you've joined a webinar or some sort of presentation where there's only one talking head mm -hmm. talking for an hour and you are so committed to the message and you are paying so much attention for the entire hour, right? That you don't care about the value of production. Yep. And that's when we started seeing, wow, messaging is so important and not the production. And I feel like a lot of attention in the digital world or when people are transitioning to, I need to create content goes into, I need it to look good and nice when it should go at first to, is my message the right yes, one? Yes, right? 100%. And 45 Live allowed us to first like nail down that message and by removing friction, it allows us to be consistent. Yeah. Well, but you mentioned some more really good things here. You have to be more authentic than perfect. And I think that's huge. Yeah. You have to know your message. Your message is the thing that's here. Like when we, when I've been on seminars or like I was just at an event, the speakers would draw me in because I knew that they were authentic, real, and were trying to be helpful to me, not they look polished, great, and we're trying to sell me. You know, that's a different thing. Yeah. Um, and then if you really want to be crazy, I thought about this when I did your 45 day live challenge, I did on Facebook and I did on Instagram. So I was doing two lives a day. I just thought about oh, that. Man. I always seem to try to do more stuff. But what I had to do was I would switch which one I would do first because I would do one and that first I'm like, eh, and I do the other one. The second one would always be better. So I was just playing the game of which one and I'd switch it back and forth on my Instagram and Facebook. That's awesome. <laughs> Dude, I love that. That that actually goes hand in hand with something that we we actually haven't, I, I personally haven't talked about this in a while, but we call it the, the CPR, right? Kind of like revive revive your content method. But honestly, CPR, what it stands for is create, right? Produce and they, uh, sorry, create, publish, reflect, mm -hmm. right? And that's what you were doing by going live in two places. You were creating, then you were hitting publish and you put it out in the world. And then you were reflecting on what you just created to see how you can make it better, right? Mm -hmm. And that's how you improve your message. And and that's the purpose of 45 Live, right? You create, you publish, and then you reflect, reflect on that content. Next day, you can improve on your message. It helps you, you know, be confident in front of the camera. After a while, you start realizing like, wow, people don't actually care as much as I thought they would 
And that thought is actually pretty liberating. Sure, you want people to care about your business and you want the attention and the traffic and all these things, which are great. But if you don't master your message, you don't put yourself out there, it's going to be very challenging. And the 45 Live allows you to do that stuff. It's, it's a great exercise. Um, I want to encourage whoever is listening to this, right, to maybe do it on your own. I don't know if we're going to do it on, all, on another group setting again. Uh, we kind of like drop it very randomly. Um, but, you know, if you guys want to connect and have more questions, let me know about that and I can send you all the information. But yeah, that's really- what I was going to say. If, if you're wanting time. to do that, reach out to the Biz Bros. They are on Instagram. They are on Facebook. You guys on LinkedIn as well? I know I've seen you on Instagram and Facebook. Yeah, it, we're on Instagram. We're not as active. Um, I think that's my my next platform that I want to be a little bit more active just because, honestly, that that's where most of our clients are going to be, right, in the B2B world. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, we're, we're still dec- deciphering. If I'm being honest, I'm not like a social media addict where mm-hmm. I, I'm like, oh, I live there and I want to come in and engage and, you know, spend all the time that Gary Vee tells you that you need to be spending in those <laughs> social <laughs> yeah. medias. Yeah. Um, I realize that there's different hows for everybody, right? Mm-hmm. There's a different how to publishing for you and there's a different how on to publishing for me and my brother. And I've also met people that are very successful, very consistent publishing, and they spend zero time in social media, right? When I ask, I, when I ask him, oh, like, what type of content do you like? They're like, dude, I don't see content at all, right? And it's funny because we actually just jump off a conversation with another agency owner. We had him on our podcast. And he was saying that he lo- like he loves kind of like starting things and then hire somebody to be consistent, right? And I know I'm deviating <laughs> a little bit in here, but I was like, I love that. I was like, that is so cool because I love starting things, right? I'm like, oh, let me build this and then kind of like validate it a little bit. But then at the time of being consistent, I'm like, okay, let me look for another fire to put out or another mm-hmm. problem. And let me look for another thing. <laughs> and now it's like, cool. I can come up with the frameworks on social media and stuff like that. Sure. I can be the one creating the content, Mm -hmm. but then at the time of being, you know, consistent and engaging and certain activities in social media, I can potentially plug somebody in that that is what they're doing. They're probably going to be doing it better than me. Yeah. Well, and you just have to find where your voice is needed and what stage in the business you're at, you know, like with me, I really focus on Facebook and some on Instagram I have a little bit on uh, LinkedIn now only because a lot of my podcast is more for B2B people. Um, Mm. But you just find your voice. And then I just schedule time. Like I'll schedule a half hour. And our buddy, George Bryant mentioned this. I don't, you might see me comment on a lot of stuff, but I'm doing it in a set time block and I'm going through a comedy so I can get some engagement and I set my stuff out and then I don't mess with it for a while. Like I said, different times during the day. Um, and I think that's the thing because people sometimes are supposed to be doing something for their business or engagement. And then they start scrolling and getting caught up and like, or like, oh, me, I'll get caught up on TikTok or something like that. You know what I mean? So you oh, have yeah. to be very specific. What process are you doing? Not, oh, I'm working and you're really yeah. not working. You're just, you know, looking at cool yeah. stuff and wasting I, time. <laughs> I can't even tell you how many times I've been to social media with an objective, like, oh, I'm going to go into send a message to this very specific person. Literally two seconds after I log in the app, I start scrolling. I like five, 10 minutes later, I'm like, wait, what did I even open Facebook yep, for? Yep. I was like, I totally forgot. It's like, oh man, I need to be way more purposeful and intentional with what I'm doing in here. So I, lo- I love that actually, right? Scheduling, committing the time to do that very specific activity. Um, that is a very valuable way to do it. If I'm being honest, that is not my fault. That's one of my weaknesses, actually. Uh, something I need to work on a little bit more. Uh, we're pretty consistently, consi- we're pretty consistent and pretty good at creating on a consistent mm-hmm. basis. Uh, I do need to focus more on, okay, this is my social media time. This is where I'm going to log in, boom, 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 do my things, and then get out of here and don't, don't see it for the rest of the day. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm with you. And, and the reason I even have a process now is because I wasn't. I was wasting time. It'd be like two, three hours. And I'd be sitting there going, why did, what did I do here? And then I'm thinking, you know, in my sales process, I have my time blocking set up for everything I do and it works. So why wouldn't I apply that to my business? You know, success leaves clues. And so that's just where I got that from. Absolutely. And uh, what's the other one? Uh, Success is boring, right? Yeah, success is boring. It is. Schedule it and come back every single day and be consistent. 
And yeah, I mean, I remember a conversation when you came to our podcast, right? You were talking yep. about your schedule and how you have your blocks and everything. And I was like, that is amazing, right? That type of commitment, determination and doing that one thing every single day at that time. It takes a lot to do that. And not everybody can do it. Um, honestly, I think that's why it was so refreshing hearing this other guy on our show uh, earlier today saying that he loves starting these things and building them and then yep. hire, hiring somebody so they can be consistent. I was like, that is a great idea. <laughs> and when like, you get to that point that. with your team, yeah, definitely do that. The only reason yeah. I do the, the boring things over and over again is because that's how I made money. So it's like, no. I've proven that concept. So even though I don't like it, because you don't like sending the emails all, all the time, you don't like doing the calls or the files all the time, but when you do the right things, it, it seems to help, you know, it, it gets absolutely, you closer absolutely. to that point. Yeah. So, and I mean, you're, the one activities that you're doing are very close to just revenue generating, right? Is your outreach, your follow-ups, it's, it's sales, which is what you do, right? That is like your craft. Um, on our end, for example, when we started, I was doing the editing, I was doing the technical work. And it got to a point where first we got a lot of clients and I was like, I need help doing this. But then it got to the point where I, lose pa I, I lost passion for the editing and the post-production process. Because I wanted to move on to different things. I'm not, yeah. I'm not, you know, I feel like I got that entrepreneurial spirit where I'm like, oh, let me solve this problem, right? Mm -hmm. And let me solve these other problems. And I don't want to just like get stuck in one lane, which yep. you know it's absolutely fine. Like there's people that thrive in that. So that's where we kind of like started looking for people. Okay, it makes sense. Let's put them in here and then we go to more revenue generating activities, right? Which is what do you do? Well, and that's what you want to do. And then like the all only caveat I always put in, because when people hear sales, they think, oh, it's bad. Yes, yeah. sales is not icky or bad. It's problem solving. Like you said, you like to put out fires. It's the same thing. And as long as I know you guys, are just, as long as you're moral, ethical, and you take care of your customer, and you have their heart in your presentation, what you're doing, you're good. Yeah, That's the absolutely. thing that a lot of, I think, entrepreneurs, probably people even you talk to run into, they're afraid, well, why would they buy from me? Or they're afraid to share their light. They really should be because- you're not going to take advantage of them. You're going to help them, you know? Yeah, dude. Like I, I, I deal with that a lot. I, not, not anymore. I, I struggled in the past with the thought of, oh man, like I feel sketchy trying to sell. Um, and it's just because of the message that I heard around sales all my life, right? Growing up mm -hmm. and people thinking that you're just trying to get the best out of them and all these things. But I, redefined completely mm -hmm. what sales mean to me right yep. now i don't see it as selling I'm, I'm i see it as helping right yes I'm, yeah. i'm just presenting an opportunity to help the other person and then it's a transaction of value uh but i'm curious for you like what is it how how would you get somebody out of that mindset of this is kind of sketchy sure um it would it really would depend on where they're at with it but it's pretty much you talk to them, you find out, okay, what is it about sales that you don't like? Is it because you feel like you're taking advantage of them? Do you feel like you are not offering enough value? What is it? So I'd start with open-ended questions to see where they're at, where that thought's coming from. And then I would just reframe it. Well, finally, you know that what you're offering with the content is going to help them. It's going to, you know, make their business better. So you're bringing them value, right? And then you'd probably say, yes. Okay, cool. So would it be better that they worked with you that actually will help them succeed in what they're doing or with someone else that's just trying to be transactional with them and it's not going to serve them and come through for them how they need? Something really simple like that. And that's just kind of where I would start and then just work with them on mindset because selling when you're helping them and you solve a problem, people will pay you. They're cool with it. Like you said, if someone comes in and does the digital stuff for you and you don't have to do all that crap, you're happy. You will happily pay them to do the editing so that you can absolutely. go and build your stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah, absolutely. And, you know, kind of like grabbing what you just said and translating it to content is literally the same. You're, when you're creating the content, create with that mindset of, okay, how can I help whoever has this one problem, uh, help them get one step closer to that solution through this piece of content. Right. And that's it. Like just create with that mindset of giving and offering value and you're going to be able to create good content. A lot of people just fall for the tricks and all this stuff. Right. And I can relate to that on sales because at first I was like, well, how do what are the, the best closes that I need to learn? Mm -hmm. And it's like, man, like just build rapport in that conversation. Genuinely try to help them. If you are not the solution, 
right? That it's going to work best for them. Tell them that and then yep. send them the right way, right? Um, yeah, it's it's very interesting. And it comes back in droves. People just see too many of the movies like Wolf of Wall Street or the little <laughs> gimmicky movies, which are fun to watch. Don't get me wrong. It's fun yeah, to no, watch, but that's not yeah. real life. Yeah. I mean, if you screw someone, they're going to come back and get you. They're never going to talk good about you again. And you're going to lose all the avenues you had there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I don't, I don't know what I would do if somebody comes to me, uh, you know, in a sales environment and, and they told me like, hey, they either got to buy or die. I was like, whoa, yo, chill. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I don't know what I would do in that aspect. I'm like, yeah, maybe you would I'm walk away. On. You'd be like, yeah, see you, like, buddy. Yeah, definitely. Moving on. <laughs> So I have another question. It's totally off subject, but I know you like coffee houses. I'm a big coffee uh -huh. drinker. What is your favorite type of coffee? Oh, man. Uh, I love coffee places, but it's honestly, it's not that much because of the coffee, if I'm being mm -hmm. honest. So, you know, growing up, my mom drinks coffee, like a lot of coffee. Mm -hmm. First thing she does when she wakes up, coffee. Uh, after lunch, coffee. After dinner, coffee. Like, coffee multiple times a day and so i grew up around kind of like some coffee culture but then i, I actually never drink any i i didn't like it that much I, I was okay with it you know it's mm -hmm. not that i didn't like it i was just like eh, it's just another drink when i came here to the states there's obviously a pretty big coffee culture here yeah um i didn't know too much of like you know local coffee shops or whatnot for me it was more like the Starbucks people just wanted to go Starbucks and whatnot and I had this boss for a little while that he was a coffee addict and <laughs> so I would go to work at his house literally by noon the guy was like six cups in Whoa. and I, now that I drink coffee I'm like bro how didn't you spend half of the morning in the bathroom you know yeah, yeah. Uh, but but not but he started kind of offering me every time he's like, Oh, you want coffee? Do you want coffee? I was like, no, thanks. I'm good. Eventually one day I came in, I was like, Oh sure. I'll take some. So I tried it. I was like, Oh man, this is pretty tasty. I like it. And then I started, you know, going to Starbucks to do some work or homework at the time when I was back in college. And then what I realized there was some local coffee shops, which mm -hmm. were pretty cool. And which I awesome. really enjoyed the environment. I was like, man, this is awesome. I really get to focus here and do my best work here. So I started going and I know I'm like dragging on the question. The question was like, oh, you're what good, is you're your good. favorite type of coffee? And I'm giving you the whole background like story here. But I started going to these places and I realized that it was a great environment to actually do work. So I actually started buying the coffee because I felt bad going to these places. <laughs> yep. I was literally sitting down there for like six, eight hours mm -hmm. all day. So I would feel bad not to buy anything. Right. Yeah. So I started buying and. Honestly, the, what I drink the most is just like an iced latte with oat milk and honey. Mm -hmm. uh, if not, I will just go for a cappuccino, but I put like a pack of sugar or something. Uh, I've been trying to get more into like uh, pour overs, like mm -hmm. legit coffee. Yep, yep. Um, you know, I befriended all, every single coffee shop that I go to since I've been so reg, I become a regular, right? When we had an office, uh, we had a coffee shop literally across the street. I spend more time in the coffee shop rather than the office. Yeah, and my yeah. brother would always be saying, hey, dude, we pay rent here. Why <laughs> don't you come to the office? I was like, I work better at the coffee shop. So I befriended the baristas. Then we move out um, kind of like 40 minutes away from there, found a new coffee shop, befriended the baristas. And then I move away now closer to the beach, which is pretty nice. Not going to yep, lie. Yep, yep. And there's a great coffee shop in there. It's actually kind of like one of the main ones in town, like local. Um, and I went there. I became really, really good friends with the baristas. And now I'm like, hey, guys, like you teach me about coffee. Like, I want to learn generally, like, you know, how do I taste the coffee? How what are the different types? What are the difference on pouring and all this stuff? So they've been, they've been super kind, kind of like trying to teach me, trying to try other stuff. But I always go back to like the ice latte. I'm, su I'm super basic. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we all do. So like I have, my wife bought me an espresso machine. So like I drink espresso oh, and nice. I put a little bit of sugar in it. But I love like pour overs. Like I love an Ethiopian pour over. It's just the flavor of it. I've had Kenya. There's different regions around the world. So like I'm a big yeah. coffee type of person. But nice. Yeah, I, I love mean, coffee house environment for sure. Dude, is is the best. And there's this thing. Um, I kind of like. I don't. I don't know if somebody else says it, but I kind of coined this term. Uh, coffee serendipity. 
right? Mm -hmm. And is honestly one of my favorite things in life so far, which is the people that you meet at the coffee shop yep. and is absolutely amazing. I met, uh, you know, VC fund managers I, or people that have their own funds that literally they're working from this tiny iPad. Mm -hmm. And I usually, if I see them multiple times at the coffee shop, I just get up and introduce myself. I'm like, Hey man, yep. like I've seen you here working a few times. Uh, what's your name? And then we start uh, meeting each other. And the guy said, oh, yeah, I sold that business for a multi-million dollars, and now I run my own fund. I was like, wow, that's crazy. The other day, I met this one guy, so he was editing videos. So he asked me to plug his computer, and I, I just made a random comment. I was like, oh, man, I saw you're editing videos. He's like, yeah, I enjoy it. And we started talking. Turns out this guy has been on YouTube for eight years years wow and he has over three million subscribers on his channel he still three does million. yeah yeah three million and he still does the editing for his video <laughs> at, 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 a local, awesome. at a local coffee shop and i'll say like, this is insane when, when i looked up the the page i literally turned at him and i was like what are you doing here <laughs> like this is this is mind-blowing right and mm -hmm. just like those two people i met so many others that are very successful or with very interesting stories. I've made great friends. Uh, you know, I, I, I've always loved the idea of having kind of like a place like uh, friends or how I met your mother and how I met your mother yep, yep. is more like a bar. But for me, it's a coffee shop, right? So when I meet with friends, I tell them, hey, let's go to this coffee shop. And you get there, everybody say, hey, Luis, are you doing right? And I, ju I just love that feeling of, of community. So the coffee set in, set in deputy is real. Let me tell you. <laughs> no, I'm with you. I'm with you. Because when I, I was just thinking about this while you were talking, I'm like, you know, back in the day, people would go to the bar, business owners, whatever, that would be the place they would meet. And there was community. And especially with COVID and all this stuff happening, now that people can get back together into the restaurants and all. Of course, you're in Florida, so you didn't have to not go anywhere. So that's good. But that yeah. whole connection matters. Like, I remember going into coffee houses and just it's a different vibe, but it's like, there's such a nice feeling of it. And everyone, for the most part, is friendly. Every once in a while, you have the one person, you know, I'm just leave them alone. They're having a bad day. But, yeah. you know, that's yeah. cool. I mean, I've personally never had a bad experience where people told me like, hey, get out of here. Like, stop being noisy, you know? Uh, I, yeah, I just, being, be, at the end of the day, it's like being nice, right? You just mm -hmm. come with a smile and... People usually, if you're smiling, they're going to smile back. And then you got immediate rapport right there. No, I love it. So tell people where we can find you at. Has anything changed since I talked to the other brother or? <laughs> uh, I don't think things have changed. Uh, plot twist, we're, we're not together anymore. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> we're still together. The biz bros. You can find us on Instagram. Mainly that's where we hang out the most. So it's at biz bros co so b-i-z-b-r-o-s-c-o that is the handle or you can look for both of us individually is just luis camejo you're gonna notice quickly which one is which uh we got pretty much the same profile picture <laughs> so just out you of have the beard. you have the yeah, beard. i got the beard and then if you want to listen to a podcast we would really appreciate it if you feel like leaving a review honest good or bad whatever it is we really appreciate it as well and just go to content is profit.com or content is profit on whatever platform that you prefer. Yeah, yeah. And look up my episode. I was on there. It was great. No, I'm teasing. Yeah, self -drug. No, absolutely. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's the episode they need to look for. Yeah. Or the one with Matt. The one with Matt that I listened to today was amazing. I love him. He's a great dude. Dude, he's so good. Yeah. Yeah, he is I, fun. That, That's one of the one episodes that I heard. And I was like, man, like, he delivered some golden boulders right there. Like, yeah. great value. Um, there was a moment during the conversation that he almost like broke down and like was about to cry. I was like, I love this moment. Yes, I, I know what that part is. So go and listen to it. I'm always, I yeah. like, yeah, it, it, it is amazing. So before I let you go, what other parting words like that you do want to inspire, leave my audience with? Whatever you want to mm. say, the floor is yours. Thanks. First of all, thank you for, for sharing the, the space. Um. You know, I think it, it it is honestly very subjective and uh, relative to people in whatever stage they are at the moment. But based on the stage where I am right now in my life, 
I think the top of mind advice, if you want to take it or not, is just take time for yourself. Sometimes we're just on a go, go, go that we just land in these routines and repetition. And then we don't really reflect on the things that we're doing. And, you know, just like the CPR method, right? The R at the end, that reflection is what is going to cause you to learn and create the space for you to move forward and evolve. So, yeah, I guess my my advice would just be to make sure you don't get caught up in all the go, go, go. Take a pause, reflect on what you're doing, maybe what you want to do, and and then craft a new plan of action and, and move forward. Fonzie, I love that. Thank you for being on my show. I super appreciate it. And for Thanks, everyone man. listening, this is Joe Graham with the 150K Podcast, where we help take your dreams to six figures and beyond. If you have anyone you know that would love this episode, send it to them. And until next time, be legendary, be great, and have an awesome night.